residents for this year. And uh, if you don't mind, we like to record these so other members who can't attend uh, can participate and watch later. So that's what Judith just started. Uh, and without further ado, I believe our next slide is our, oh yeah, welcome guests. For some reason, do we not do the pledge on virtual meetings? We don't do the pledge on virtual meetings. Good. Okay. Well, we all trust your allegiance to the United States of America is secure. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, I cannot necessarily see all the guests uh, because, again, I'm using my phone. So I see some members, and I don't know if you brought a guest, if you can highlight who's here. If you're not a member of our club, um, we obviously have some speakers we'll introduce in a moment. But um, any guests, any uh, club members want to introduce any guests? Um, we actually have have a few. Um, Dan, who has become a, a a we've seen him at a bunch of our events as a guest. So welcome back, Dan. Um, and I'm trying to see. Uh, we have three people from Emilio Nara's foundation, and they are gonna be speaking just briefly after our. Um, main speaker. And then Keith, do you want to introduce yourself from Pride Industries? A little muddled. Keith Robinson of Pride Industries. We hear from the other we're supporting the different different cultural development opportunities. Thanks, Keith. I'm not sure everybody heard that. So maybe if you want to throw something in the chat, just saying, you know, who you are. Welcome to the meeting. Thank you for joining us. Anyone else, Judith? I, I think that's all. Everyone else, I think, is a member looking looking um, at the names here. Yeah, I think I think that's it. OK, awesome. All right. And I'm not sure, am I introducing Justin, Judith, or do we have somebody else? We have Emily. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. Uh, I'm super excited. Do I introduce him now? You did, now's the time, Emily. Okay, You're now's up. the time. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Justin Brooks, our speaker. And Justin, in many ways, you remind me of one of my favorite characters, um, Atticus Finch. Um, so hopefully that's a compliment. I think he's inspired a lot of good. I'm going to read from online about Professor Brooks. He directs the LLM program in U.S. law in Spanish at the USD School of Law. As the program director, he administers a national MOVE court program in Mexico and coordinates the work of 35 innocence organizations across Latin America. Before USD, he practiced as a criminal defense attorney in Washington, D.C., Michigan, Illinois, and California, doing both trial and appellate courts. Um, and he was the founding director of the California Innocence Project uh, up until last year, where his team helped um, free 40 innocent people. So there's a lot of great stuff that I'm sure he will be able to share with us. I'm very much looking forward to it. Thanks for being here, Professor Brooks. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I actually had Atticus Finch's picture on my wall all the way through college and law school. So big fan. Uh, okay, let me open my little PowerPoint here. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, and I know I don't have a lot of time, and I, I teach a 14-week course on the topic I'm going to talk about today, which is wrongful convictions. Um, I've written the only um, law school textbook on the subject, and I recently released this book, You Might Go to Prison Even Though You're Innocent, um, which is a book where I wanted regular non-lawyers to understand this phenomenon of wrongful convictions and that it's not what we used to think that this was this thing that maybe happened once in a blue moon but is far more common than i think most of us would be comfortable with and my journey on this began 30 years ago with this woman marilyn malero i read about her um, in the newspaper an article that said that she'd been sentenced to death on a plea bargain in chicago and it made no sense to me that someone could be sentenced to death on a plea bargain. You know, it's not exactly a bargain. And uh, so I went out and met with her on death row. 
and ended up taking on her case. And at the time I was teaching law school in Michigan, I just went to my criminal law class and said, who wants to help me out on this case? This woman's on death row. She pled out. And she also told me she was innocent. And four kids raised their hands. They came over to my house that night in East Lansing. And uh, we sat around the kitchen table, started going through the police reports. And the first time we visited the crime scene, we realized she was factually innocent, that there's no way the witnesses saw what they said they saw. And the whole case started to unravel. Um, that When I got her death sentence reversed, that case inspired me to move to California, which is the, the belly of the beast, the largest prison system in the world, the largest death row in the world at the time. Um, and launched the California Innocence Project. At that time, several of us around the country were launching these projects. Barry Sheck started one in New York. Larry Marshall started one in Chicago. Jackie McMurtry started one in Washington. There were basically seven of us who were doing this. And to put that in context, over the last 25 years, those projects have grown and grown and grown. And at our last meeting, we had 1,200 people there who are now working in innocent organizations. It just started with a handful of uh, idealists sharing a pizza in Chicago back in the mid-90s. Um, the sad thing is, during the time that I've worked in the project for 24 years in San Diego, we freed 40 innocent people from prison, but I was never able to free Marilyn because no court would allow her to withdraw her guilty plea. So even though I got her off death row and got her death sentence reversed, I wasn't able to get her fully exonerated. And that did not happen until last year. And this is uh, me having dinner with her for the first time. Um, she spent 27 years in prison, many of those years on death row. It's finally discovered something I'd been saying for three decades, which is the officer in her case completely fabricated her case. That officer... Uh, uh, Officer Guevara, you can look up, is now responsible for three dozen exonerations. There's been more than 30 innocent people freed from prison that he basically just set up um, in closing out his cases. And so <laughs> I start with this point that this work is hard and often long and takes some real dedication, but we've had some good results. So my book starts with this story as well because uh, the publisher asked me to write a book kind of looking back at my career and what's everything I've learned about wrongful convictions. And the first thing I learned from Marilyn's case is when you hire the wrong lawyer, sometimes things go wrong. And Marilyn made a mistake that's a classic mistake. She was assigned a public defender, a really excellent lawyer, a woman who'd done hundreds of jury trials. And her friends thought, no, you want a private lawyer. So they fire this excellent public defender, and they hire a guy who's got a little office in the neighborhood who doesn't even do criminal work, never handled a homicide, and he just pleads her straight up to double homicide without doing any investigation in the case and takes a $10,000 retainer for that. Um, I argued his incompetence all the way up to the United States Supreme Court and was unable to get the courts to reverse her conviction on ineffective assistance of counsel, even though this guy had never handled a case like this, did no investigation, looked at no reports, didn't go to where the witnesses were standing. And her case was his final case before he ran out of the courtroom. And I finally found him studying to be a priest. And he's now actually a priest in Chicago. So this was a totally incompetent dump truck of a lawyer. And still, I couldn't get the courts to reverse on that ground. And it's very, very difficult to do that. So I get into that in the first chapter of the book, everything you should know about hiring a lawyer and all the problems we have with our criminal appointment system. In chapter two, I look at an interesting phenomenon that I learned about practicing in California. Um, when I first moved there, I didn't really understand California at all. I'd just seen it on TV and movies and uh, had a different impression of what it really is. It took me a little while to realize that the further you get from the water, the weirder it gets. Uh, but I quickly learned that by practicing out in some of the small towns. And there's this interesting phenomenon of wrongful convictions that they're actually very high level of wrongful convictions in rural areas and urban areas. And the reason is in rural areas, there's under policing and often the police don't know how to process homicide scenes. They don't have a lot of experience with it. And a lot of mistakes get made in urban areas, the opposite, there's over policing 
and sometimes overzealous policing that leads to rounding up groups of people when only maybe a couple of them are involved in the crime. And both those phenomena lead to wrongful convictions. So if you learn nothing from me today, the moral of the story is live in the suburbs. Uh, that will decrease your chances of wrongful conviction. Uh, this is what happened to my client, Bill Richards. He lived out in Asperia in the middle of nowhere, came home one night, found his wife beaten to death. Police came, contaminated the crime scene, had no idea what they were doing, didn't even secure the body. Dogs started burying the body while police were on the scene. Um, just crazy, horrible forensic stuff that led him to decades in prison. Here's the day I walked him out after 20 years in prison. And over-policing, as I said, that's the opposite phenomenon where these rings often lead to, to bringing in the wrong people. In chapter three, as I rush through this, and you got a few to go, uh, I don't know how many of you are married or live with your partner, and I'm not telling you to break up and leave tonight, but you do increase your chance of being wrongful convicted just by living with another person. Because uh, if you come home and find them dead, you will be a suspect in that crime because more than 50% of homicides in the United States are domestic. So the police are always looking at the partner. And if you're unfortunate, like my client Kimberly Long, and you had an argument in a bar earlier in the day with your boyfriend, and you come home and find him beaten to death, you're likely, likely to be a suspect. And here's a little of her story. Yeah, she was a good girl. Blonde haired, gorgeous child. She was always happy. Then she grew up into a, a beautiful young girl. A beautiful young girl who became a nurse. She cares about people. She wants to help. And a mother of two children. We were just lucky parents. Always thought, well, my God, you know, things couldn't even get any better. Then, without warning, their lives turned upside down. October 6, 2003, everything stopped. It was about an hour before midnight when Oswaldo Condi, also known as Ozzy, and his live-in girlfriend, Kimberly Long, got into a heated argument after a long day and night of bar hopping with friends. Long, according to court records, left with a male friend. Sometime between 1.30 and 2 in the morning, the exact time is in dispute, the friend gave Long a ride home. Kimberly Long says she walked into the home she shared with Condi to find blood splattered in the living room and Condi's bloody body on the sofa. He had been beaten to death. Court records show Long called 911 at 2.09 that morning. This crime scene was covered in blood. It was a very violent murder, and there's no way that the person who committed this murder wouldn't have been covered in blood, and Kimberly had no blood on her. Justin Brooks is the director of the California Innocence Project at the Western School of Law in San Diego. This is one of those classic cases where the person who finds the dead person ends up becoming a suspect. Brooks is now representing Long. Her first trial ended in a mistrial. Nine jurors had voted not guilty, and three had voted guilty. When she was tried a second time, that jury convicted her. At her sentencing, the judge who tried the case, Judge Patrick Major, said, if the court would have heard the evidence in this case, I would have found the defendant not guilty. Her case was paper thin when it went to trial, and now when you consider what we know since then, absolutely a certainty that she's innocent. Brooks says there is new evidence pointing to Long's innocence, including DNA found on a cigarette that puts an unknown person at the scene of the crime. And there's some significant evidence that Ozzy was dead um, long before Kimberly came home. But that wasn't developed sufficiently, and Kimberly ends up in this prison. Kimberly Long agreed to speak to us on camera, but the State Department of Corrections would not allow our cameras inside the prison. So instead, we spoke to her with the help of a prison telephone. What do you want people to know about your case? That I'm factually innocent. So if you were to sit down and actually look at my case, that there's nothing that points to me going Aussie. I'm actually factually innocent. And that's what I want people to know. And that this can happen to anybody. Brooks says the Innocence Project is petitioning the California Supreme Court to get the case reopened, and he has petitioned the governor for clemency. The governor doesn't even have to declare she's innocent. He's just got to say, we looked at the case, the case is thin, there's some evidence of innocence, she served time in prison, and she should be granted clemency. Do you believe you will one day 
walk out of there an exonerated woman? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think about it all the time. That's what I do think about. I have these whole scenarios on how it's going to happen. And who's going to be there and what I'm going to say. Kimberly Long's parents say this photo, taken just two months before she went to prison, captures the essence of their dreams, with Kimberly hands at the wheel, navigating into open water. Our daughter will come home. And justice will be served. You betcha. True justice. In Corona, Randy Page, CBS 2 News. So fortunately, she did come home. Uh, this is the moment of her exoneration. But it was seven years in prison, and it was almost 20 years of litigation um, for her ultimately to get her life back. She just got her nurse's license back this month, which she had to also fight to get back to try to get, you know, piece her life back together. Um, chapter four, I get into what is maybe the leading cause of wrongful conviction in the world. And I go around the world talking on this topic, and that is bad identifications. And the bottom line is, if you kind of look like other people in the world, you got a shot at being wrongfully convicted. Um, and a good example of that is the Uriah Courtney case from San Diego, where this 15-year-old girl was attacked in La Mesa, horrible sexual assault. A guy jumps out of a truck, pulls her behind a bush, sexually assaults her. She gets away. She gets to the police station. And she does this drawing of the suspect and this drawing of his truck. Police, based on that drawing, they search the neighborhood. They find a truck that's similar. My client lives in that house. That's his father-in-law's truck. They then do this photo array to try to identify him. Now, what's wrong with this photo array based on this description? Take a look at that drawing. Now, this poor kid is traumatized. She obviously doesn't remember much about her attacker because all she draws on this drawing is it's a guy with a goatee. There's no other identifying feature. Like he probably had eyebrows, he probably had ears, but there's nothing else on this. And then when they do a photo array, what do they do? Number one, no facial hair. Number two, no facial hair. Number three, a little Scooby-Doo thing going on. Number four, my client, exact same goatee. Number five, nothing. Number six has got the little separated thing going on. So of course she identifies him because he now looks most like what she remembers. Um, he gets a long prison sentence. We then petition the court in San Diego to do DNA testing on the victim's clothes, which nobody ever tested. We find male pattern DNA everywhere we look on her clothes. That doesn't match our client, but that's not definitive, right? Because everybody has DNA from other people on our clothes. Somebody could cough on you or a million different ways. But via the miracle of the DNA data bank and the day we ran the test, there were more than 10 million profiles in it from all over the United States we somehow get a direct hit back with this dude who lives in the neighborhood who has prior sexual assaults and look at his picture next to my client. They don't look that different. It just so happened when he was arrested, the day he was arrested, the guy on the left, he didn't have a goatee that day um, for his prior sexual assaults. But you know, they're both white males, late twenties, similar hairline, dark eyebrows. Like she didn't do a terrible job. It's just, it wasn't the right guy. And this is how simple it is. So there's problems with people's memories. There's problem with procedures. I've spent a ton of time in my book talking about this problem because it is likely the leading cause in the planet because there are problems in every country with the way they do this, not just the United States. And there's him being released after seven years in prison. Jason Kindle was identified based on his voice as a robber of an office depot because the robber was wearing a mask. And the officer literally said to an employee, did it sound like Jason Kindle? And she said, oh, kind of did. And fortunately, we were able to use the height of the door entering the store against the height of our client. And the person who, who did the robbery was six inches taller. And this is the day he gets released. He was actually had this case, was the first person I got released in California. It was by Judge Ito. If some of you are old enough to remember him, it was right after the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, Derek Harris, nine years in prison, bad ID case out of L.A. Raphael Madrigal was working in a factory 20 miles from the crime scene, but his lawyer never checked that out. And here he is, nine years in prison. 
Guy Miles, one of the sweetest clients I've ever had, 17 years in prison based on a bad ID. And in fact, here's a little short video to give you some inspiration about what it's like walking an innocent person out of prison. He didn't tell his parents he was coming home and we were bringing him home in the middle of the night. And on this video, you see him first calling his daughter and then surprising his parents. And you can see the look on my face of what it feels like to finish a case like this. I am home, baby girl. I am home. Justin is right here. He's right here. He's not lying. We're heading home and this nightmare is over. I mean, finally, this 18 year nightmare is over for Guy and his family. They've been supporting him the whole time. They don't actually know he's coming home tonight, but we're going to bring him home right now to him. And you know, it's just a huge relief for the California Innocence Project to be done with this case and bring him home. We've been waiting a long time. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. oh, my God. See, all these people right here have been in my corner since day one. And yeah, that one day. They knew I was innocent going in. They know I'm innocent coming out. Such a sweet person, just so sad. Um, not one woman, not two women, three separate women identified Luis Vargas as a rapist in LA. And we were able to link 35 sexual assaults to this unknown assailant using DNA. All three were wrong with their identification. Um, all had the same MO and all matched up with the DNA. So the district attorney actually, as soon as I presented the evidence to them, they conceded the case immediately, knowing that he was innocent. And here he is, this, the moment he's exonerated after 17 years in prison. Um, Reggie Cole, 17 years in prison, also bad ID. Alex Torres, 21 years in prison, bad ID. Tim Atkins, 23 years in prison, bad ID. You can see, by the way, in this picture what this job has done to me. Look how fantastic my hair used to look. Quentin Morris, 27 years in prison, bad ID. Rolling Adams, 28 years in prison, bad ID. And these are just my cases. Like every project in the world has a stack of these bad ID cases. If the system doesn't, the jurors think when someone goes into court and says, I'm 100% sure that's the guy who did it, that will get you convicted no matter how bad the process was. Um, Glenn Boyd, 28 years in prison, bad ID. And you notice how many are people of color, by the way, because that's where you got even more bad IDs. 28 years in prison. We just got Gerardo out several months ago this past year. Um, in chapter five, again, it's something that a lot of people still don't believe, and that's that innocent people do often confess to crimes they didn't commit. And there's a whole ton of reasons for this, but basically after hours and hours of interrogation, people will admit to things they didn't do. We now know definitively that 17% of the wrongful convictions later exonerated by DNA those people confessed, which means innocent people do confess. A lot of it's to do with the read technique, which I've got no time to go into today, but it's terrible training that the police receive. Uh, in chapter six, I go into our saddest cases, which are baby death cases. There's been lots of parents and caregivers wrongfully convicted in baby death cases. A lot of it has to do with problems with the shaken baby syndrome and a lot of doctors who believe it doesn't even exist. But the fundamental problem is the three symptoms that have been linked to shaken baby also have been linked to all these other things. And so there's there's situations that aren't abusive situations that lead to baby deaths. Um, that happened to San Diego and Ken Marsh, who was one of my clients who spent 20 years in prison. That happened to Suzanne Johnson, another one of my clients spent 21 years in prison. That happened to Alan Jimenez, 24 years in prison. All parents and caregivers where it was wrongfully um, decided. And these cases, by the way, we had concessions from district attorney's offices that ultimately admitted that they got it wrong and that people were innocent. And Matt and Grace Hong, which look that one up, 
but the most surreal case I ever had, I represented a couple in the Middle East in Qatar who were wrongfully convicted of, of murdering their daughter. Um, in chapter seven, I get into all the problem with all the junk sciences, and I literally have an entire course just on this chapter. So no time to do it today, but there's a lot of stuff we thought was good science in the past that we know is not good science today. Uh, we know there's a problem with arson science, which will led my client Joanne Parks to spend 29 years in prison. There's a problem with ballistics. There's a problem with all kinds of different sciences. California, you might not know this, but leads the nation in wrongful convictions of child molestation. In fact, California is home of the most expensive trial in the history of the United States, which is the McMartin Preschool Trial in Los Angeles, where children said they were not only molested, but there were underground caverns and there was witchcraft going on in this preschool. The reason the trial was so expensive is they excavated the entire neighborhood looking for these caverns and ultimately realized that these children were just questioned in such improper manners that they started fabricating fantasies that were actually fed to them and none of the stuff had happened. Um, I had one of these cases, John Stoll, out in Bakersfield who spent 20 years in prison under the same thing, poor interviewing techniques that lead to false statements by children. And there's a documentary about that case and chapter nine, there's all these complex reasons innocent people go to prison, but then there's just the simple somebody told a lie. And there's all kinds of lies that go unchecked in our system. 31% um, are bad information from informants. And my most famous case is the Brian Banks case. I don't know if you've all heard of it. It's made into a feature film that you can watch on Hulu tonight. Uh, Greg Kinnear plays me in the movie. And uh, here's a little clip about his story. Uh, we're going to start here with a story that reads like a movie. It's about a young guy with a promising NFL career derailed by a prison sentence for a crime he did not commit. Yeah, it took him years to just clear his name, and now he's getting a second chance to pursue his dream. Sports anchor Rob Powers from our New York City affiliate WABC is here with more. So many people rooting for this guy. Really a fascinating story. It's hard not to root for him. The National Football League preseason, it can drag on, but at least... One player is enjoying every minute of it. The NFL has quarterbacks, halfbacks, and fullbacks. And this preseason, one very important comeback. 28-year-old Atlanta Falcon linebacker, rookie Brian Banks, is one step closer to making his dream a reality after taking to the gridiron against the Cincinnati Bengals this week. Nice job getting off a block and making a play. It's still one of those situations where, like, you know, it's happened. I like now is just replaying it right here. But this is no ordinary rookie. Banks joined the Falcons after spending five years in jail and five on parole. Why? He was wrongly convicted of raping a high school classmate. In May 2012, justice was served. The verdict for Banks overturned the new ruling, not guilty. Well, people's motion to dismiss this case pursuant to Section 1305. You may not ever get the answers as to why I was supposed to go through what I went through. But... I know that I'm here today and I remain unbroken. And you know, you look at the NFL right now with all the stories that are out there, the arrests, the Aaron Hernandez saga that's played out in front of us in the media based on the hope that he has shown all of us. I wouldn't bet against Brian Bank. Before the charges, Banks was a high school football star headed to the University of Southern California on a full scholarship to play for one of college football's best teams. But now what's in the past is in the past. I will take this opportunity and be the best person that I can be in this world and to show people that no matter what you go through, there is light at the tunnels. The truth is that Brian committed no crime that day, that he's a strong young man with an amazing future, and we want to get him back on track. And back on track he is. Banks signed with the Falcons in April and picked up two tackles in Thursday's game. Definitely one of the best moments of my life. Just an absolute crazy case. I mean, the 15-year-old the, the kid who had accused him actually came forward years later, Facebook friend requested him and said, can we let bygones be bygones? Sorry, I made up that stuff about you raping me in high school. Just absolutely crazy. Um, Danny Larson set up by LAPD, totally based on lies. Horace Roberts case, totally based on lies. Mike Hanline, 36 years in prison, case totally fabricated by the police and everyone involved in it. And this woman standing next to him in this photo, that's his wife who waited for him to come home 36 years. And they're still together. 
um, crazy. Every one of these is a crazy story. Um, and then, and you can watch a video about that at your leisure, about me taking him to Carl's Jr. for his first meal. <laughs> but, um, and chapter 10 is kind of the, the toughest chapter to write in my book because I've never been able to walk someone out of prison by going to a judge and saying, this person was convicted because they're black. This person was convicted because they're poor. But we know that race and poverty permeate the problems within the system and exacerbate it and make everything worse. And as long we cannot ignore the bias that's involved in people's decision making and the difference it makes looking across a courtroom and seeing someone who looks like your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, or who doesn't look like those people and the difference that can make. But all the studies show that there's dramatic distinctions in treatment based on race and poverty. Um, if you want to follow me and see my daily rants, I'm on Instagram and Twitter and everything else at Justin O. Brooks. If you're interested in getting my book, you could actually point at the screen right now, this QR code and order it off amazon.com. Uh, and again, it's called, you might go to prison even though you're innocent. If you do get it, I'd love a nice review as well of it. But uh, it really highlights and brings, it's, it's been very successful, the book so far, and brought the story of this little project that got started in San Diego. And the amazing thing is people in San Diego most of them don't realize that it's been the home of the California Innocence Project for the last quarter century and that all these exonerations have come from a little office at Second and Cedar with a bunch of law students digging through boxes and, and finding innocent people and um, getting them out of prison. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Wow. Oh, thanks, Justin. That was I think that I think I could sum it up by saying that's incredible. Like these stories you're telling are are, are unbelievable. Um, do you have a minute or two to stick around in case there's any questions? I'm sure this group sure. is kind of bubbling with questions. Um, if you want to just unmute uh, or raise your hand, I can call on you. But if you just want to unmute, if you have a question for Justin, or you can put it in the chat. Hey, there's some stuff in the chat. Yeah, we got lawyers. Uh, there we go. Jay Jeffcoat. <laughs> I knew we've got lawyers in this club. Jay, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, I like I'm never leaving my condo again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's solid advice. <laughs> Jay, can you unmute yourself? Jay, we cannot hear you. There we go. Lucky. Okay. Go ahead, Jay. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just curious, Justin, how in the world were you able to financially support these great causes? Because, you know, it's not exactly the kind of thing that people say, oh, yeah, I want to help innocent people get free. Or, you know, so I would be, just be interested in the, in the mechanics and the history and the background. It's obviously been extremely successful and you've done so well for, for our profession. But I'd be interested in a little bit about how you did that. Sure. Um, so it was a combination. Of, I, I had a very diverse portfolio of fundraising, which diversity is always good in funding. Um, it started with a very embarrassing situation at a cocktail party where I met this woman who said she wanted to help out. And then she said her husband wanted to help out. And I said, what does he do? And she says, oh, he plays guitar. So I started bragging about my guitar playing uh, in my little coffee houses. And then after about three or four more questions, I found out her husband was Joe Walsh, the lead guitarist of the Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Eagles became our first big funder, became friends with Joe and the band. And they did, they, we sponsored one of their tours or they sponsored us for one of their tours. And then I started, you know, just doing a lot of, of fundraisers, talking to people's living rooms. San Diego is not an easy place to raise money. If we were in LA, I would have raised a lot more money if I'd founded it there, but hindsight's 2020. That's what most of the liberal money in America is, but it's not in San Diego, it's in LA. Uh, so I did a lot of trips to LA to raise money. I then did a lot of trips to DC. I applied for criminal justice block grants that a lot of people aren't aware of. There's money available in DC at the state level. So it was a combination of donations, foundation money, federal grants, and state grants. And I'd raised for the last 24 years, I raised at least a million a year, sometimes two million in a year. Um, and that allowed me to eventually go from just me and a half-time assistant to I had 10 full-time um, attorneys working on the cases and about a hundred volunteer attorneys. And we ended up having more volume than any project in the world um, because California has the biggest prison system. So uh, yeah, 
and I hate that part of the job too. Nobody gets into the stuff to raise money, but it's you, you got to do it. Keep the train running. That's a that's a great story. I just thought another band could have been the Killers. <laughs> I'd love a younger band like that. The <laughs> great thing about the Eagles is their fans have a lot of money, but yeah, yeah they're running out of time. So you want those middle aged bands that you know the Billy Joels of the world. They'll charge five hundred dollars for a cheap seat. Uh, but yeah. I was going to say, Justin, does that mean they wrote the song Desperado, you know, after working with you? They actually drink. <laughs> Can't take credit for that, but yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Dan, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Ryan, I think I speak for everyone. Um, you are really an amazing individual and you really command respect. And I can't believe what you've done. I, I'm just in shock. I... I mean, I couldn't, I, I can't believe it. And, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. Well said. One last question for Justin. Anybody else? I have a quick question. Oh, yeah. sorry, Susan. Go ahead. Go, Susan. Um. So how do these incarcerated individuals find you? Like how, I'm sure there's a lot of folks that are like, oh yeah, you can get me off too right or wrong but how do yes, they uh, i wondered that myself when i first went to california and then the la times did an editorial entitled welcome justin brooks to california and the mail hasn't stopped since then <laughs> so pretty much everybody in prison knows about it has my address posted in the library address of the project um so yeah no shortage of cases never ran short of cases Go ahead, Lance. You were going to say something, and then we'll we'll let the Bowers ask a question too. Then we'll wrap it up. Justin, I was just willing again. Thank you for your um, your passion and what you're doing. And I was wondering if you would be um, able to speak to the San Diego Paralegal Association and our paralegal students. Sure. Drop me an okay. email, and I'm happy to set it up. Excellent. Thank you. And so my email again is is, is Justin O Brooks at gmail .com. It's actually Justino Brooks. I grew up in Puerto Rico and that was my name down there. And I think we had the couple, yeah. Karen. Yeah. The Bowers. I, I was just oh. curious, early on in your uh, presentation, you mentioned a police officer that fabricated 30 some cases. Was, you know, when you get into a situation like that, is there any ever any ramifications for those individuals? So, you know, when I first came to California, the maximum someone could get for wrongful conviction was $10,000 and you needed a lawyer to file a suit so nobody ever got it. So one of the first laws that I worked on was getting compensation for people who are wrongfully incarcerated. And now in California, they get $150 a day for every day they're wrongfully incarcerated. So my clients who did 20 years are now getting a million dollars. Um, we also, by the way, had to litigate that for years against our current vice president, but that's another story. Uh, she wasn't so great on that issue. Uh, in terms of anything happening to the police, very, 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 very rarely does anything happen in terms of ramifications to police, to lawyers, to judges. We just had our first judge in U.S. history spend some time in jail for um, basically fabricating a case in Texas. The only case where I've seen a lawyer really, really punished, which it kind of irritates me that it's this case, but it's the Duke Lacrosse case, if some of you remember that. And the annoying thing about that for me is those kids were wrongfully charged with sexually assaulting this uh, this woman who was stripping at their party. Um, and she did fabricate testimony, but they never spent any time in jail. They ended up having a massive multi-million dollar lawsuit. The DA actually got disbarred. And the reason was because these were rich kids from New York. They were rich white kids lacrosse players from New York who had a lot of power and took down that office. And my clients who spend 20, 30 years in prison, nothing happens to them as a result of it. So it's it's kind of a sad story with that. But so far, um, Detective Grivard, I put in context, I last heard he hasn't even lost his pension in Chicago. He retired as a detective. They've paid out over $100 million in lawsuits over his work. And he's just retired pulling his pension. So um, yeah, that's it's not good the way. And, and until we do something about that, of course, it's not going to end. 
And I'm, you know, I'm talking to you from Mexico and I, I spend about a third of my time training lawyers in Mexico and working down here because Mexico has transitioned to an American type trial system. And for the first time in Mexican history, you can cross-examine a police officer at trial. And just imagine that for a second, for 400 years, the second most corrupt police force in the world, second only to Egypt, you didn't have a chance to question a police report. Whatever they write in the police report, it's fact, and you're convicted by it. But the problem in Mexico is uh, lawyers don't know how to do those cross-examinations because it never existed before. And the other problem is there's more than 2,000 law schools in Mexico, whereas there's only 200 in the United States, and it's still not part of their curriculum. So I'm spending a lot of my time on that, just going into law schools and talking about adopting trial skills curriculum. So wow. there's a lot of work to do, in short, both domestically and abroad. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I could spend some time with you guys today. I hope you pick up my book and take a look at it. I think if you enjoyed my presentation today, you'll enjoy that even more. You could also listen to the audio book and listen to me for eight hours talk on that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Round of applause. Yeah. My pleasure. Enjoy Thanks. the rest of your meeting. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and your efforts. My pleasure. Bye. Wow. Wow. I bet we all learned something there. Um, I had no idea what the project was about. Obviously, I read about it, but um, incredible experience. Um, we've got 17 minutes before the hour, so we're going to rush through some of these slides. Um, and I get to introduce somebody that I know. I didn't know you were coming today, Elsa. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, hey. Elsa and I uh, did our master's together at USD in nonprofit management. And this is a new role for you. Congratulations on Thank being you. CEO. So I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Steve. Hi, Emily. I also remember you from Bleed. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, Kiwanis Club of San Diego. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Elsa Morales Roth. I'm the executive director for the Emilio Nares Foundation. We just wanted to say hi. Uh, we serve, um, our mission is to serve low income families navigate their journey um, with their child's journey with cancer and life threatening diseases. We're the only nonprofit inside of Radies Children Hospital that provides culturally responsive case management and resources like free transportation for medical treatments, access to Medi-Cal, Social Security, mental health and financial assistance. Uh, we serve a lot of Latino, Haitian, Creole, Middle Eastern, every single uh, refugees, immigrants. We serve a lot of people that do not understand the healthcare system, the American healthcare system. And when they're, you're, imagine your kiddo gets diagnosed with cancer. Um, you don't know where to, who to talk to, how to navigate, how to even apply for any type of benefit. So what we do is handhold them through that process and support them with, again, from free transportation to financial assistance. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of great work. Uh, we serve more than 1,000 families here in San Diego and Orange Counties. Um, and we just wanted to say hi, and hopefully we can start joining you and and we can partner up. We have a lot of volunteer opportunities where you can get to see the kiddos. We would love to invite you to one of our Ring the Bell celebrations where our kiddos celebrate that they're cancer free. So we will be sending out that invitation through Judith. Thank you so much for the service that you do to the community. Thank you, Kiwanis Club. Um, and hi to everyone. <laughs> I see hi, Emily. <laughs> Thanks, Elsa. Thank nice. you. Awesome. Okay, so what we didn't, what we lacked in birthdays last month, we are making up for in February. Uh, look at that robust list. A few of you are on the call, um, which is exciting. Uh, most of you know we don't have a club in person luncheon in the month of February because of our Laurels for Leaders event. So we won't get the opportunity to sing to you in person. Uh, but we'll lump you in with the March birthdays. Um, we've done singing at virtual meetings. It's not all it's cracked up to be. So I'm going to spare you uh, us all singing out of tune, out of sync on, on the virtual <laughs> platform. But um, happy birthday to all of you who are here. I'm actually scanning the list. I know Lauren Cook is here. Uh, who else is here? That's um, Emily. Emily's also here. Oh, yeah. Emily, that's sorry. I would love to celebrate year round, but that's not my birthday. Oh, my birthday oh, oh, not not your birthday? No, it's not till May 8th, but I appreciate the early. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow, where I'll did I come it. up with that, Emily? Make your I mean, pay fine Valentine's anyway. Day, I exude so much love. That's probably something. Maybe, I don't know. Somebody I'm, thought you were I a Valentine. I will fix that. A Valentine. We will day. celebrate twice then. 
Um, and I'm only paying you, once though. Just kidding. Yeah, I was gonna say those of you who who it is your birthday. Uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, make a gift to the club uh, with your years of life plus your years of service in the club. Um, so reach out to Judith if you want to be invoiced for that, or you can bring cold hard cash to the next meeting and make a big scene out of it, and we'll sing for you in March. Um, speaking of cold hard cash, it's Bill's Bucks time. So this is an opportunity to share some good news, happy, maybe maybe some sad news. Um, and then also fines. Uh, I know Gordon's on the call. I don't know if he's still on the call, but my fine master, Gordon, uh, who does a good job of keeping an eye on people in the community uh, and getting highlighted. So with that, let's see who has some happy, sad, or fines to give out. Doug does. Hey, Doug. Doug will put in five bucks because I managed to survive the tornado. Okay. Because there was a tornado warning for Tierra Santa, for those of you who don't know, and I'm not kidding. Congratulations, Doug, for being alive. All right, who else? <laughs> you can uh, you can find me five bucks for being late uh, to the meeting and came in just in time to hear him say, that I should not be married because then I can be thoughtful to um, very easy. Or have, you already wrongfully convicted you, Justin. Or you should shave your goatee, Justin, because I mean, oh. I, see, I think, I, by keeping it, I can shave it and change my appearance. It's <laughs> hard to grow. You've spent way too I'll, much time thinking about this. I love it. Um, I'll, also, fine. Um, I'll find ten dollars because Sean ha hosted Jay and Joyce and Kevin and my friend Megan for a little Shantini <laughs> night, and I managed to not wear anything with Kiwanis on it. And Kevin gave me a really hard time about it, and has been talking about finding me big and he's not on this call so i'm doing it to be truthful and prove my innocence on this call that i'm finding myself ten dollars um but we had a great time and i'm going to organize another one because sean is an awesome host if you, you can see part of his gallery behind him now but there is a lot of history in his place um so sean thanks for hosting us we had a great time and uh i hope to see everybody at the upcoming social we already have a lot of people signed up so we'll get into that with upcoming events but ten dollars for not wearing my pin and this is a reminder a lot of you go out and do stuff always put a pin if you need an extra pin let us know, leave one in your car, leave it in your wallet, leave, you know, uh, it's a great way to get people to know about us. And um, we're doing so much good work, so many upcoming events that are amazing. So looking uh, really forward to everything on deck. Awesome. I was going to do $20 of happy bucks. For those that don't, you don't know, our family did a wonderful bucket list trip to Australia for the holidays. I've been scuba diving for 35 years. I finally got to do the Great Barrier Reef and it was Every bit as amazing as I had hoped it would be. So $20 of happy bucks from the Bowers. <laughs> awesome. Now that's 20 American dollars, right? Not a Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know if you had some I cash you needed to get offload. Uh, Greg did wear his Kiwanis shirt on the trip, though. So I almost feel like we should be um, paying some money for that, too. But great job to take Kiwanis down under with you, Greg. I, I purposely brought it with me. <laughs> Greg, next time we bump into you at Society, the first round's on us, okay? So for that. Uh... All right. Well, the, the weather up here isn't much better than down there right now. So I think we'll be heading back sooner and later. Ah, nice. Anyone else? Happy? Sad? I have some, I have some happy bucks. Um, can you, Judith, do you mind billing me? Let's just say five. Um, yeah, I'm billing but... everyone. Okay, perfect. Um, happy bucks because my brother and his wife and their two kids just moved back to San Diego um, from Tennessee. So it's fun to have them and to have my niece and nephew here and to be like an aunt. <laughs> That's awesome. You don't hear a lot of people moving back to San Diego from places like no, Tennessee no. with no state income tax and low housing costs. <laughs> the funny thing is they're moving in with my parents oh, and my okay. parents are building a cottage in their backyard, but it's not ready yet. So my parents' house is like, I, I might write like my next children's book about it because it's my parents, 
you know, my brother, his wife, their dogs, their cats. It's just, it's my dad's an introvert. He's going crazy. So that's also kind of fun. And and I'm sure Judith, you see in the chat, but both Gordon and uh, Sanam have self find for for certain things. The integrity in this club is amazing. Um, appreciate that, uh, Gordon and Sanam. Last call. Okay, move on to our recap. So we had our luncheon uh, in January in the smaller section of Elijah's, but it worked out for the number of people we had. We were over in the corner um, and we heard from, um, why am I blanking on the name of the organization? The Burnham, the Burnham Center for- Innovation. Innovation. Yes. Innovation, um, which was great. Uh, and then we also had a um, service project at the Ronald McDonald House where we served meals. I was not there. Looking at the picture, everybody who attended that event is not on this call, I think. No, Kevin. Our Karina Karina was there and she's on the call. Oh, oh is that you wearing the hat, Karina? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I look like a boy, but you have to keep your back <laughs> in that. Um, we had a great time. Eric brought uh, three students three or four students um, with him and Kevin uh, June Frost was there and Mike and Chuck came out for the check presentation. Although I've now realized that is the worst way to take the photo because you can't see any of our faces. So we'll work on that for next year. But yeah, we did a nacho night. So uh, lots of guac and uh, it was a great time. So hope you can join us for the next one. There's still a few seats left, but they're going quick, but we're serving a uh, dinner at Path. So make sure you sign up. And speaking of that, we have some upcoming events. So um, February, shortest month of the year, um, but we do have our biggest event of the year, Laurels for Leaders, our 67th annual, uh, coming up next week, next Tuesday at SDSU. I believe registration is closed now. Yes. So if you missed the boat, you can still donate to the event if you want. Um, but uh, we are uh, locked up for that event. It's going to be a fantastic event. The rain is going to be gone next week, so it's going to be beautiful and sunny uh, and a lot of uh, club participation. And then like Karina mentioned, we have our uh, networking night at Casa Machado. And if you haven't been there, it is right by the Montgomery uh, Field. Montgomery Field, right? My, um, the small little airport in Kearney Mesa. Gibbs Montgomery Field. Gibbs Montgomery yeah, Field. Gibbs, I Montgomery from Bill uh, Gibbs. Yeah, it is literally at the at their little airport there. So if you haven't been there before, come check it out. It's a really cool place. Um, good margaritas, good happy hour. Um, so hopefully you can join us there. Um, Karina is putting all the links to these events in the chat. So if you want to jump on right now and sign up, you can do that. Um, and then she also mentioned the service project at PATH. So that's another meal serving event on the 25th. And then looking ahead to March, we have, we'll be back. Um, well, actually, update. I actually, I, I, I knew this. I was just reading the script. But uh, the March 5th event is no longer going to be virtual. It is going to be in person because our illustrious program committee uh, got a commitment from the new San Diego State head football coach, Sean Lewis, to come and speak to our club. So we are going to be in person at Elijah's. And I'm looking at Judith. Did we get the book Big Room confirmed? No, we are not confirmed yet. Okay, so we are waiting for confirmation that we are in the big room. Otherwise, we'll probably move the location to a place that we can have a big audience. So stay tuned, but hold the date. Uh, it still will be a luncheon on the 5th. It's just no longer going to be virtual. Um, obviously, this is a great uh, opportunity for when we have a speaker like this to invite friends and colleagues who are interested in the club and want to learn more to come and participate. Um, we're hoping for a big crowd. Uh, Gordon or Jay or anybody else want to add anything to that? It was, it was all their hard work, um, leveraging their relationships at SDSU and um, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, very exciting news. March 5th will be in person, uh, hopefully at Elijah's, but we'll confirm the location as soon as we, we can. So anything else on that, Judith? Did I catch all the... That was it. Okay. Um, can I can I just do two things, Steve? Um, yeah. Also this month, uh, the key, there's camp or key leader, Camp Cedar Glen. And uh, all the kids go for a weekend, the 23rd through the 25th up to Cedar Glen, and they really need chaperones. So if anyone wants to go, it's a really inspirational event. And you can also tell um, any high school kid, they don't need to be in key club to go to this. And it's a very good leadership um, 
you know, team building, like just a lot of good life skills come out of this. So I tell people, if you know anyone of that age, make sure they know about this camp. But um, if you are interested in getting a student involved or going yourself, let me know. Um, and then also we announced, uh, you probably all got in your inboxes, our new community impact grant partners. I wanted to give a big kudos to the team that reviewed that. Every year we get more and more exponentially applications and it is very hard to trim it down. We trimmed it down to 12 partners this year. So um, I really thank everyone that spent the time reviewing them. And I know that the projects are really going to transform some lives. So we are going to be doing our giving day, our third annual, I think it's our third annual, um, at, or uh, maybe fourth, I don't know, around there. Um, it's our third. At the third. Okay. Thank you, Judith. Um, on the 27th of March at the Westgate Hotel, and we'll send out more information on that, but make sure that you mark your calendars. It'll be again in the afternoon, um, starting at 4.30, and we'll get to hear from all of the organizations on all the new projects and uh, be inspired by everything we get to support and probably find out a lot more ways that we can get involved and help support them throughout the year. And yeah, I also put our scholars recognition is going to be our next big one in April. So just get these things locked in your calendar now because you won't want to miss them. They're really our like key things that we do. And poor Judith is stacked nonstop. But everyone be nice to Judith and make sure you sign up for all of these events. Awesome. I, I say we find Mark McDonald for sitting there, obviously looking at his phone. Wow, and, strong and, move. And he's but muted. Strong move by the governor-elect. <laughs> That's because I'm working. I don't know about you. Oh. Cold <laughs> shot. Wow. <laughs> wow. Shots fired. On that note, at 12.59, I think we're uh, going to bring this meeting to a close. Yeah, exactly. Burn from Lauren Cook. Um, so thanks, everyone. Great seeing you. Great crowd for a virtual luncheon. And hopefully, with all the events coming up, we'll bump into each other in person later this month.